Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Very warm, um, very warm welcome to this call, although it's very cold outside. Um, <clears throat> yeah, warm welcome to those of you joining us live and also the several hundred of you joining us in the very near future on our YouTube channel. Um, I'm so pleased that we've got Emma with us this evening. I'm um, having uh, found celebrity status. I'm so pleased you've got a time to uh, join us. Um, we first encountered Emma, I think, in the 2020 Day Conference. And I remember Emma then um, introducing the subjects in a very short paper because time was so limited. So we've got a bit more time this evening, Emma. And thank you so much for, um, for joining us. Um, our screens are yours. Thank you. Thank you for the privilege of talking to you. Um, yeah, so I got, I got, I found out about this, this fantastic group actually while researching uh, an upcoming book um, that I'm writing on radio astronomy in general. And I was researching the history of, of radio astronomy. And I was thinking, gosh, I think I'm, I'm sure there must be groups still around like doing, doing these things that I just haven't heard. Anyway, I did some digging and I found the most incredible community. And I got in contact and I said, I've just got to speak because I really want to <laughs> let everybody know that, that I'm very excited. And, and um, the more I have talked to people, the more I have realized how little I know <laughs> when it comes to using radio data in order to make uh, inferences about that universe. Um, and so this is actually one of the, I'm sure, kindest, most welcoming, but also the most terrifying audience that I could have, because the vast majority of you probably know a lot more about how to get these, the, the, uh, these, these actual antennas working that, that I use on a daily basis. So it's going to be fairly, well, it is a structured talk in that I have prepared it, but also I like to talk about what's interesting me on the day um and certainly in the last few months i can't help but share with you what's been going on with jwst as well hence um special guest star i think because us um ignored wavelengths have to stick together i think uh in the face of optical bias okay so I am a researcher at the University of Nottingham. I've spent most of my career in, um, in London, uh, but made a move last year for a lectureship. Um, and I study the era of the first stars. Uh, it's an era that I fell into studying. Um, gosh, how did that happen? Uh, <laughs> basically, I was given a project for my PhD on dark Emmy. Um, it did not thrill me, <laughs> as in they didn't even finish the paragraph describing the, the subject before I thought, no, nah, far too intangible. Um, I need something that I can really grip onto here. So I was given a subject of, of, of the first stars and the, and the early earliest billion years that, that are missing. And that part, part of that project was, was using radio data, which I had never come across before starting my PhD, um, which I spent a PhD learning um, in order to, to just be able to use it. Uh, but it is the best way of exploring uh, this, 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 the dark ages. What happens just after the bang? What happens after the Big Bang up until the kind of galaxies are well established the kind of galaxies that we see today that's the kind of thing that i'm going to be discovering um the covering today but as i said i cannot help but discuss the first billion years of the universe um in the context of what has been a major accomplishment in astronomy this year which is the launch of the james webb space telescope which is an infrared telescope um and it launched almost a year ago, Christmas Day. Um, I'm sure many of you watched, I did. My children had to stop playing with the toys that were noisy and had to play with quiet toys while I watched that launch with tears in my eyes and all fingers and everything that I had crossed. All of my breath held because I was absolutely petrified that it would not go to plan, that launch, after decades of, of delays and budget issues, this $10 billion 
contraption managed to launch and what's more it managed to um create it managed to successfully travel uh, over a six month period to its its place of safety um and it had to go through i think it's i want to say 295 separate mechanical um movements in order to unfurl the mirror so the mirror is actually in three parts it's like it's a folding mirror almost like um like if you've got a, a dining table that you would fold up and down um it, it's like that then that was they couldn't fit it in the rocket otherwise it's six and a half meters across compared that's about three times Hubble um you couldn't put that in a rocket so they had to put it together and then the uh, sun shields that you can see this highly reflective material here which um, each one is around the area of the tennis court and all of these were linked with tiny tiny very very thin wires that had to unpackage and tauten in exactly the right way and if any one of those 295 steps did not complete then this telescope would have been useless quite petrifying and as much as you can test things at NASA and you can have the best engineers in the world um, none of us knew whether it would work because I don't think anybody knew all of the technology because a lot of it was secretive because it was of military or, uh, origin but it did launch and in July um, there was the announcement that there would be a press conference and not just any press conference but a press conference held by the President of the United States which is quite um, well, quite unprecedented, I suppose. And it, it was it was a very bizarre experience. I'm sure a lot of you watched it live as well. Um, I stayed up for it and, and to see to see him <laughs> kind of very brief conference of a of an image that was just out of reach, actually. It was always in the background of these shots of the American flag. And I was like, no, no, zoom in. I can't see it. <laughs> this, is a, this is the image of our our generation scientifically, and, and we couldn't see it. Um but we did get a close up eventually and the images that came out of the James Webb Space Telescope were absolutely astonishing. So I am going to pepper this talk with them because it's fun. Um, so and they, you will realise that it has it has great meaning for my field and also implications for the radio um, study as well. So this is one of the images that came out. This is Stefan's Quintet. This is a grouping of five galaxies. It's uh, quite a famous cluster because it's one of the tightest galaxy clusters known, including the merger. Um, the four in a line vertically are all at roughly the same part in space, but the one on the left um, is actually very far off. It's just that it's, um, it's all been flattened together. And what, it is an unfair comparison here because Hubble was not built for infrared, but these are all at roughly infrared wavelengths. Um, and you can see that, of course, J.D. Rusty built for infrared is really quite astonishing. So if we are going to be a little bit fairer, we'll do optical as it is meant to be. Um, and you can see that these JWST images, even at the, the specialist wavelengths comparing to optical at its specialist wavelength, still sheds an incredible extra level of detail. We're able to peer inside these galaxies. So whereas the central Hubble one, the optical one, this is the one I have on my, um, my it used to be on my dining room wall. Um, for years, I had this as a one meter by one meter canvas. It's now in the background of my office while I await the JWST one. Um, but what you can see is these, these almost quite friendly, almost quite inviting, almost quite, well, they are dusty, very, very dusty, glowing with stars. Um, these galaxies and then if we look at the infrared waves and particularly the the mid infrared on the left compared to the near infrared on the right that's what those acronyms are um, on the left you get to really peer inside past all of that dust which captures and scatters the optical light and we are able to to see these the 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 structures of the of the, the gas and, and where the stars are forming in a much more specific way. And I said to somebody yesterday or a couple of days ago that if I was to paint or a universe or a set of galaxies where the Dalek would live or similar, it would be this because I think it's really quite an unsettling image, actually. You it's it's of partly due to the colour scheme, it, it really does look 
uncomfortable compared to what we are used to when we're seeing galaxies. And I think that is a part because we're so used to seeing Hubble spirals and Hubble ellipticals for decades. We are now seeing the universe in a very, very different way. So let's see if I can move on from that. So I'm not sure why I'm not moving. Okay, yeah, um, this is um, the one that was released first. This is the image that was released first during the press conference. Um, this is the James Webb Space Telescope Deep Field. So this is an area on the sky, roughly um, the area of a grain of sand held at arm's length, extremely small portion of the sky as you're looking at it. And yet it is filled with thousands of galaxies, just absolutely packed with them. And this image is remarkable not necessarily immediately because of how it looks, because if to the uh, to the untrained eye, it looks much like the Hubble deep field. We're used to seeing lots of different galactic diversity and structure like this. What's remarkable is that this image took only 12 hours to form. So the story goes, they switched it on at dinner time, they went to bed. They looked up what data had come in at breakfast and this is what they got. So this is the barely calibrated, nothing special done to it, nothing fancy. This is what came out of the telescope. To get this <laughs> is, is really quite astonishing. And to say that this is going to be going for many years and this is what they got in the first 12 hours, that's what we, the main message I think we need to take away from, from this image in particular. But what you can see here, is um, a lot of different forms of galaxies. I won't go too long into this, but you've got some beautiful spirals. Um, can you see my curse on the screen? Yes, good. Okay, so, you, so this is my favorite. <laughs> Not even relevant, but you get to hear it because you're a captain or, captive audience. Um, <laughs> this is my favorite one because it's got such a beautifully tight spiral structure and it's, it's lovely to, to see that. This is another one up here that I really like. Um, really nice large structure up here but you can't help but notice also these stretched forms these arcs of light and this is because we are imaging a galaxy cluster so large that it has warped space time and in warping that space time it is as if we have got a magnifying glass as if we're Sherlock Holmes we are looking at the universe and things that were far too far away before for us to be able to get even with JWST, the galaxy uh, universe has done us a favor and it has bent space time into a natural magnifying glass, which has magnified and distorted galaxies from much farther away. Um, and that's what we can see in these arcs here. So these are galaxies which are actually behind the galaxy cluster, far, 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 far farther. Um, and yet they are popped out that we can see them. Um, really, really quite beautiful. And it was an exhausting summer <laughs> for, for anyone in my field because we've been waiting for this for the best part of a decade. This, this came um, in July and then the, I think it was, it, was it less than 24 hours? It can't have been much more. The first research papers started to arrive on what this data was telling us and that was because it was produced as free data it was open source data which means which meant that the minute president biden introduced it it was available on the jwst website for download so anybody could go and have a look at it and make their own scientific conclusions of it sound or not so the first thing that a lot of scientists did was they looked at this image and they said that's very red, that must be quite old. That's very red, that must be quite old. That's very red and very small, that must be even older. And there was paper after paper after paper, which singled out galaxies using various computational methods which could find data within this, what looks very low resolution, but if you could download the data, you could just keep zooming and zooming and zooming. And people searched for, um, what what were very red galaxies. Now, the reason that we can see that, the reason that we can say as a rule of thumb, the redder the galaxy, the older it is, is because of how light behaves in our universe. So to 
recap over something that, that, that I'm sure has come up in, in many talks, but which is vital, so I'm going to say it again. It is that light, even though it's extremely fast, like 300 million meters per second, it is not infinite in speed. So whereas, um, it's not gonna make sense, that little emoji is gonna look like it's dead in a minute. Yeah, sorry. It's been, this used to be in a longer series for, for um, younger uh, the primary school kids sort of thing. Anyway, um, the point is that if you're trying to talk to your friend, an alien researcher in Andromeda, it will take around two and a half million years for any message you send to get there at the speed of light. And it would take that long to get, so you wouldn't be able to have a friendship, you'd be, you know. Um, and it would be about five million year uh, difference. But it doesn't even work in terms of even if you could live that long, because you will never match up because of this delay in time, your messages, you are actually looking back in time and the delay is too long. So let's have a look here. So if you were this alien researcher in Andromeda and you were receiving a message from um, Earth, it at, right at this point, they would only just be getting light from Earth produced by reflections off the earliest human species. So the, the Homo habilis, the earliest of human ancestry, that's what they will see right now on Earth. Now, equivalently, flip that round. This means that any time we observe Andromeda, we are observing it as it was two and a half million years ago. So this has huge consequences for cosmology and the study of the early universe, which I do. And that is that all we have to do is design telescopes which are able to gather light that has been traveling to us for 13 billion years or so. And then we might be able to learn a little bit about this time. It's a way of looking back in time, studying that early universe. But that light doesn't just have a delay as it's coming to us, it also changes in color. And that is because of the expansion of the universe. So all of this time, the universe is always expanding. Every second, every megaparsec gets 70 kilometers bigger. Constant expansion of space time. Now that takes a lot of energy to fight or rather if you want to think of it as wavelengths, your wavelengths get stretched. And so over time, any particular light that is emitted at one wavelength will become much redder. So this is called redshift. What that means is that, as I said, as a rule of thumb, we can say if something is redder, it's possibly older because it has had its light redshifted by a larger amount. It's been fighting the expansion of the universe for a longer time, which means it must be older. But how can we tell what a galaxy's color was meant to be in the first place? Surely you could just have a red galaxy. And yes, absolutely, you can. And this is um, why it's only now in the last month or so that we have been able to start confirming what were over the summer rule of thumb, um, uh, rule of thumb uh, results, which were that red. <laughs> Um, and, and the reason for that is that we look a little bit deeper into the light. And there are standards within, within um, well, in, 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 the chemi in the chemicals, whatever chemical you have, chemicals are made of um, a very particular atomic structure, which will be the same in any galaxy. So the atomic structure of calcium here is the atomic structure of calcium in Andromeda, in any other galaxy. And the so the light that can be absorbed or emitted preferentially by that element will be the same as well. And we, we know that elements prefer um, different lights, uh, different, different energy levels within their, their atomic structures and can absorb wavelengths of light preferentially or emit wavelengths of light preferentially from any chemistry, um, Kind of high school exam like this is the flame test here so you can see the different the different elements can produce these different um, wavelengths of light preferentially now what this means is that if we have a spectrum of light as we can see at the top then um, each an element might have a very well known line within that that it prefers absorption line 
So if we know exactly the pattern that, that let's say iron, iron is a very common one, that iron, um, nice strong line, that iron um, produces within this spectrum like this, then we can search for that pattern in the spectrum of the galaxy that we are able to observe. Now this takes a lot of time. So compared to just saying that looks red, this you have to really focus the telescope again and look just at that point. Um, you can't do this kind of big image all at once. And this is why it wasn't done overnight. This is why it took six months of applying for more JWST line time, looking at the very red galaxy and seeing whether a very well-known doublet, let's say, um, let's say it represents iron, was in fact not quite where it should be in the spectrum. Because if it's been shifted where we expect it to be on Earth, then that's been redshifted and we know that that galaxy is moving away from us, is that far away, is moving away from us due to the expansion of the universe and how much it has shifted can tell us how far away it is and how old that light is, how long it has taken that light to get to us. We've been doing that pretty successfully um over the last few months so it was i think the first this is called spectroscopy and the first spectroscopic confirmation of a jwst uh, galaxy i think came in october um may have been early november very late october um, but recently and happily they are actually confirmed so over the summer it was exhausting because honestly almost every day there was a new paper saying we found something really red and actually it's only a billion years after the Big Bang, only 800 million years after the Big Bang, 700, 600, it's almost like being at an auction until finally the, the bidding kind of stopped after about a month that like, yeah, you know what, I think we found something around 300 million years after the Big Bang and everyone kind of settled down. <laughs> um, but I held my breath for quite a while. I didn't want to trust any of those until we had these spectroscopic confirmations and we have started having them, which is really, really promising. This is one um, such galaxy. This is called the Cosmic Tomato by the people that, that, that wrote the paper on it. So they get to choose. Um, and this is a galaxy that um, appears to be for, um, pictured as it was 400 million years after the Big Bang. So this light has been traveling to us for about 13.4 billion years. So we're seeing a very young galaxy. It's difficult to, to, to get your head around it sometimes, but this isn't an old galaxy. This is old light from a young galaxy. This galaxy will look completely different by now. It's probably merged away and dissipated. You know, good, goodness knows what's happened to it. I don't like to um, conjecture and we'll never know. <laughs> um, but there's wonderful things to be found in JWST and there will be discovery after discovery. And it is quite remarkable that in the space of a year, we have gone from being proud that we have a galaxy at a billion years after the Big Bang to now having around at last count 15 candidates um, in the first few hundred million years. And there's already new mysteries, which is very exciting as well, um, because this is actually far larger than we thought galaxies should be at the time that it is predicted to have been around. So this is only about 125 times um, size of Milky Way, uh, sorry, 125 times smaller than the Milky Way. Um, so it's, it is small. There's only about a billion stars in there compared to about 250 billion in the, in the, in the Milky Way. Um, but still, for something only 400 million years after the Big Bang, that's, that's too big. We can't explain that right now. That's exciting, keeps me in the job. But we do need to be careful. Um, and this is one of the, the kind of talks I've been giving over the summer is that, with this kind of uh, release of data, open source, which which many will argue is a very good thing. If I get a chance to, to chat, well, no, I'll, I'll just mention it now, actually. Just this week, we sent around a survey which is discussing whether we should um, release data um, for, uh, sooner from it, what is called its proprietary period. So we're meant to keep data to ourselves, do our research, and then release it to the public. 
Um, and one of the arguments for that is, is because public funding goes to universities. One of the arguments against that is that we're so busy teaching most of the time <laughs> that we don't actually get chance to, to do any research until over the summer. But one of the reasons for it is that um, this in this kind of this 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 look at this the way that the data was released over the summer for example a lot of people in astronomy that didn't really know or didn't understand the calibration of the telescope were looking at this data and making conclusions that were possibly a little bit a bit rocky but as i said now these first spectroscopic confirmations have been coming through we're very confident that even if some of those predictions some of those suggestions aren't quite correct actually there's so many of them um at these high redshifts being discovered and now there's these handful of spectroscopic confirmations of things a few hundred million years after the big bang that there is absolutely no doubt in anybody's mind that jwst is is doing some phenomenal work but it is not the only scope that is going to be um leading the next 50 years or whatever it's going to be doing some wonderful things and that is because in the early universe, if you have this red shifting, then something that is 13.4 billion years ago, by the time that light gets to us, yes, it is going to, most of the light's going to have red shifted out of the optical and into the infrared, which is why JWST is able to pick up things, pick up galaxies older than Hubble could, because Hubble, they were just invisible to Hubble because all of that had red shifted out of the optical. But of course we can ask the question, hang on, what about those galaxies or stars or, or gas that was so soon after the Big Bang that even that has redshifted out of the infrared and is only now available in the radio. Um, and that's where radio telescopes are still absolutely vital in this field. And that is to study the very earliest time. So the, the first couple of hundred million years after Big Bang, the, the so-called dark ages, where nothing much was going on. And it's very, very wishy-washy how you define these eras, and I'll get, I'll get onto that in a little bit. But we're basically talking about the first, the era where the stars were forming um, and the era where the first galaxies were forming, um, but certainly not where you had the kind of, what I will call large galaxies, such as the cosmic tomato, um, 400 million years and the reason we're interested about this time is because it hasn't been observed before because it is a missing billion years um, in our galaxy and that's a lot of data to be missing it's about the equivalent if you compare it to a human lifetime missing everything from the, first day you're, um, from the day you're born to the first day you go to school usually formative time and formative for the universe as well because those baby stars, those baby black holes, particularly, those black holes stick around for the whole time of the universe. And so studying the baby black holes could really help us understand what we just don't get at all about why there's so many super massive black holes that are far larger than they should be currently. Um, yes, and, and the other the other reasons to do this are not just because um, they, it can help us solve the modern day mysteries, um, but it's also because it's an interesting time in itself. It's it's the period of change from where you went from a big bang where everything was so violent and hot um, that you could not form anything larger than hydrogen or helium. Anything larger than that, it would just get knocked apart within a very short time scale and so you couldn't build upon it and yet here we are made of carbon breathing oxygen wearing silver and gold how did all of these heavier elements come into being this is the mysteries that are kind of solved within that time but there's a part of me that the the both of those arguments that my heart's not really in it um, i present them in case that they are interested that they, they that's what sparks it in somebody else but for me um growing up wanting to be a historian um and wanting to study the ancient egyptians or 
uh, well, no, it was pretty much the Egyptians <laughs> looking at hieroglyphics and all of this and wanting to uncover lost tombs. Um, I switched to physics late in my career, in my in my um, teenage times, and switched my university courses. Um, and it's, it, it is partly because I found that physics and specifically astrophysics was still full of mystery and actually a much larger mystery than uncovering something 5,000 years ago. We we're talking about some, uncovering something 13 billion years ago. So for me, as a historian with a telescope, I just want to know what happened firsthand. And there is no better way of doing that than looking back in time using the radio and getting a firsthand account from those first stars and those first galaxies and those first black holes. But it was a time of, of incredible simplicity back then. So now we are presented in our chemistry um, lessons with this, this horrid <laughs> creation of <laughs> periodic table of elements, very clever, but goodness me, um, very, very intimidating unless you're going on pointless, I think. Uh, and so in astronomy, as I'm sure you're all aware, uh, but for anybody that isn't, there is a specific point of jargon, which is that we do simplify it considerably, especially when we're cosmologists, because after the Big Bang, we have hydrogen, we have helium and nothing. But where we do create the elements later on, um, we just call them metals, because even now, our sun, for example, which is considered a metal rich star, is still only 2% metals compared to hydrogen um, and we just like rounding things up we're used to big distances big times and so we round up all of this as well so anytime i say metal metal free star that's a that's another word for a first star because it's only in very very early universe that we could create a metal free star they are any they are completely different to um what we see today um, and in the in the the time after the Big Bang, after everything has has started calming down, let's say a hundred million years after the Big Bang, what you have is the dark matter coalescing in the background. So whereas we I'm just gonna pause that for a minute, so we're getting a little bit too ahead of ourselves there. Um, yeah. So whereas we know this time is the dark ages, because if oh, I do apologise, I'm not doing very well at that video, am I? There we go. Um, because where it is known as the dark ages, because nothing much is actually going on that we can see with our eyes. If you were there, you'd see nothing at all in the, in the optical because by 100 million years after the Big Bang, even the radiation from the Big Bang has, has calmed down and gone into to the longer wavelengths out of the optical. Behind things, if you could see dark matter, this mysterious substance that, that, that underlays all the matter in our universe really, um, what you would see is a scaffold. You would see a scaffolding of filaments and where these filaments meet nodes, increasing densities of dark matter. And what's happening is again, unseen to our eyes, is the normal matter that makes up all this hydrogen is, is falling in to um, the same nodes and filaments because it's being gravitationally attracted by dark matter. The dark matter is famously uninteractive. That's why you can't see the light. It doesn't interact with light at all, but it does interact gravitationally. So it's able to pull in this hydrogen. And when the hydrogen begins to create into get into these really high nodes of density, it's at that point that you begin to start fusion and you begin to heat this gas. And that's what we're seeing here is we're seeing sudden outbursts of heating of the hydrogen gas along these filaments and and you can see in the simulations that it just traces the dark matter web beautifully so whereas it's called the dark ages it's it's dark to our eyes but it doesn't mean that there's nothing much going on which is um what you might infer from it but during this time you have this you have these stars beginning to form and whereas um, dark matter, because it cannot interact with light, it cannot lose energy efficiently. So whereas a very hot cloud of um, dark matter, it will condense, it will condense, but at some point this pressure will stick from condensing. It won't go further into a dark matter star or anything like that. But the hydrogen that overlays it, that is able to, for example, take two moving hydrogen atoms that are really energetic, they bash into each other 
and then you'd excite an atomic transition in one, which would then fall back down, emit a photon, and in that way, you would send out radiation. You carry out some of what was kinetic energy and now turn it into this, this photon, this packet of energy that was free to go way far away from the cloud. It's carrying energy out of the system. So whereas the dark matter stops, the hydrogen keeps on going and it collapses into a star, whereby we get fusion, we create much heavier elements, hydrogen to helium, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, and very quickly you get a supernova because you run out of fuel and you spread all of these heavier elements, you pollute the local gas. And that's why you cannot form these first stars, these metal free stars anywhere in the universe today, because the universe was so well polluted so fast that you couldn't, you couldn't get in there. But in this way, you get more and more metals over the generations. So you go from metal free to metal poor to metal rich. And these stars are very different. They're very massive, about 100 times the mass of our sun. Um, and that means they live very short lifetimes, only of about a million years, because even though they've got more hydrogen by mass, the, gra the increased gravitational pressure because of that means that the fusion process goes that much faster. So your, your first star will be gone within a million years. Oh dear, does that mean that we can't see them? Well, no, because I've already spoiled that, that kind of, that, that by saying we can look back in time which is a nice excuse to show you another JWST image called the Cosmic Eclipse. Um, and this, what we're seeing here is a huge, a huge cloud of gas um, in the orange. And what's being carved out of it with this really quite sharp wall is, is um, a, a bout of star formation that's actually out of the image, but that is creating such violent radiation that it is carving a, a bubble, a cavity out of this gas cloud and this is where radio really comes into it when it comes to the first stars because with wst we can look back um, to these first galaxies but we don't have the resolution to find a first star now with radio we can look back even, even further and you think maybe we can now be able to single out one of these stars but unfortunately even with radio with the resolution we can't single out single stars. The radiation from single stars is still too weak. But what we can do is we can measure the effect on the environment of these stars. And this is a really great example of how stars can have an effect on the environment because the star might be too small to be able to see. But look at this massive cavity that it is managing to form. That is actually what we measure. Rather, we measure the orange, we measure the, um, the gas cloud in the early universe when a first star is just forming and carving out these cavities, ionizing the hydrogen um, around it. I've seen that. Let's go a bit because I want to make sure I get to my radio. So, because of my audience, I don't actually need to go into my, my usual spiel of how radio data might look a little bit underwhelming, but, but because you will believe me that it's not, um, that it can tell you incredible things beyond the other wavelengths. And it's just because our eyes are not made to interface with the radio sky that we can't quite pass it. And so, we do have to build these, these very, very different ways of interfacing with the universe that, that, that doesn't just adapt the lenses in my eyes, could be a lens in that, but actually adapt copper wire <laughs> um, and some wood into be able to measure um, the radio waves. So uh, a nice excuse to show you my holiday snaps from this year as a little break from that very dense cosmology. <laughs> um, this, I, I went on a little bit of a tour of radio telescopes um, this year. Wherever I'm traveling, I always look up if there's one nearby. Uh, this one in Berkeley, I was lucky enough to go there on the day and they made time for me to go down and watch it track a lunar mission, which was really fun. That's a NASA owned one. Um, the Allen Telescope Array here, this um, I was emailing Paul about at the time. It was, it was incredible. I went to San Francisco and found out this was four and a half hours drive north, which is nothing in America. So I hired a car, um, went into the Alpine Mountains of California and just spent the most incredible day with four living scientists at one of the most remote places um, 
with with 42 dishes looking for the extraterrestrial intelligence signals. So scanning 200 star systems every well one star system every five minutes in a catalogue of 200 over and over and over and over again. Listening. Really, really fascinating on that one. Um, and of course, Joshua Bank, um, which we all love. And I was very lucky in July to get to go to Arecibo um, on what was a spiritual pilgrimage, quite frankly, because it, of course, it collapsed several years ago. I did not go there necessarily to use it for science, just though I was lucky to use science from it um, and analyze or asteroid um, data. But it was it was quite incredible. It's such an icon radio astronomy so um yeah i have a, i have a little bolt from it back there that they did give me i did not just take it without permission but it was very sobering to talk to the people there who still had tears in their eyes but what our CBO does remain is an example of what radio technology can do which is build big <laughs> 300 meters in diameter you can really build these things large and and of course this is because the wavelength of radio is so much larger that it doesn't see the holes in the mesh that we make it from or even more in the interferometers that i use we can space antennas or stations of antennas kilometers apart and still have it that the universe sees it as a mirror and so this is low far um it's about 1300 antennas uh in in the netherlands um and then you've got the square kilometer array which is the one that I'm helping to build at the minute. And this is 130,000 of these in the Western Australian desert. I think I've got my little model here, it's a shame, but never mind. The Christmas tree antennas. Um, so we decorate them baubles when we've got prototypes in our offices all over. Um, but what this SKA is being built to do is build a film, a movie of our universe growing up over that lost billion years. So as I've said, what we're trying to study is not the radiation from the star, but it is the radiation from the surroundings, and in particular, the hydrogen gas. So hydrogen is everywhere. It's essential for all of radio astronomy, vast majority of um, radio astronomy, and in particular, very famous um, wavelength, 21 centimetre wavelength. So the 21 centimetre radiation from hydrogen um, due to an interaction between the electron and the proton means that it's very bright. So the dark ages are very bright <laughs> in the hydrogen in this 21 centimetre radiation. So we're hoping to tune in to that. And if we go a little bit further down, then we can go to the cosmic dawn. And what happens at the cosmic dawn, this is around 180 million years after the Big Bang, is that the, this, these, the carving out of those bubbles that we've seen with JWST happens then just as it does now. And it separates out this proton and this electron. It ionizes it. It means you can't get this 21 centimeter radiation from there anymore. You get what we see as a Swiss cheese model. So you get these lovely spherical bubbles. bubbles. Go even further and you begin to really reionize all of the hydrogen. Um, with, with galaxies, so huge collections of, of um, second generation stars, and we see much larger, wispier bubbles. So happily, I don't have to be like, oh, it's underwhelming, because you know the power of this data. And actually being able to image this every 0.1 megahertz, um, but over this billion year time means we, do, we can build up a, a film of the bubbles forming, merging, growing, and from that, be able to say, well, using lots of computer models, this means that our universe was mostly metal free stars at this point. This means that there was a population of really weird, large black holes, for example, kind of huge amount. Um, the SKA is, is the prototype arrays are working. So this is actually uh, the time lapse of the um, South African elements and um, we are using the lower ones the christmas trees as i've mentioned and we are starting to get radio data out of it which i'm going to skip talking about this one particularly because a it's not my field um and it's normally what i just say to be like look isn't radio data beautiful but what i do want to do if you'll give me a few more minutes if you if you won't then give me a nice big thumbs up as a collective audience and i'll shut up but i never normally talk about this but with you lot i feel like i'm in a safe space <laughs> we can tell you about the issues to do with radio data um which is that we have um, um we have 
been analyzing data from LOFAR, which was my first telescope, trying to find the signals from this gas, this hydrogen gas. Um, we started looking at uh, about 400 million years after Big Bang, tuning into those frequencies, so 115 to 200 megahertz. Um, and we've been doing that since, since 2011. <laughs> Um, and it's been hard and it's been hard for a couple of reasons but one of the reasons is because of the foreground of everything that is in front of us and our background cosmological signal um, uh, our first star signal uh, and that is there's, there's a heck of a lot of other stuff in the galaxy as you all know which creates a mission which will be received to us at the same wavelength that we are we are observing at in particular synchrotron from our galaxy is around uh, 10,000 times larger than the first star signal. Uh, and this was my PhD. My PhD was removing these foregrounds and creating statistical methods to separate out these signals. Um, and the reason that we can do this is, I'm afraid the lines aren't very thick here. I did try to um, get this done today, but my code <laughs> broke for making it. Um, and the reason we can do that is because these signals behave very differently over frequency. So synchrotron radiation, we've known about that for a very long time. It has a very, very well-defined spectral behavior. Um, and so at all of the, if we tune our radio telescope to the different frequencies in the, the smooth orange curve here, our synchrotron, our galactic foreground, behave in a really nice manner. We understand them. They're much larger, but at least they're predictable. Whereas our cosmological signal, because of the, these bubbles forming, merging, overlapping, then you get a really dissonant signal. It's very, 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 very odd over frequency. And towards the, towards the end of the frequency range, which is your lower redshift, so closer to us in time, it begins to it begins to tail off and that's because you you've really just ionized all of this hydrogen you have no radiation left so there are happily statistical methods able to separate out very dissonant from very smooth spectral signals and that is what i um that's what i do as a day job that's what i've got a new phd student working on um just this week she's managed to, to first do her first separation um unsimulated <laughs> so we're still getting there and the reason we are still getting there um is because it's not just our galaxy that is a problem um wow that did not go up well did it that resolution okay i'm gonna have to explain that slightly um what you're seeing here is in the green circle on the left is the north celestial pole field of lofar where we're studying for the first star signal and you can see it blown up on the right um, we originally in 2011 just built up a sky catalogue of all these point sources on the right, thinking just the stuff in our field a little bit further, that'll be fine. Um, it many years of just <laughs> many years <laughs> discovered that the, the telescope behaved in such a way that it was able to pick up even the faintest, faintest, even that had been modeled and removed, it was still picking up. Um, very bright sources such as um, SIGE and CASE for the A-team um, and that, that, that broke it for a few years. Um, we're still going, we're getting a lot better, we are really at the point now where we think we've made the breakthrough and it's just a case of um, running through the calibration of the thousand hours, 1300 hours that we have on, on disk at the minute. Um, I, I don't know how long I was meant to talk for, 45 minutes, or I'm not sure, but I've got another five. If you'd like You're okay for it. time. We normally allow about an hour. Oh, brilliant. Okay, so I've actually probably been going too fast, but you should never tell me I've got more time because I'll just pick a subject, but more for you. Okay, so what um, is interesting then, if I'm allowed, if I am allowed to just have a, a, a minute more on this, is that this has taken a lot longer than we thought it would. So it is a fairly cliche story that you will be to the start of your PhD that you'll get data by the end of it and you never do. Um, with me I did get data and my PhD thesis contains the first data that has been analysed by the first stars group but it was just noise <laughs> um, so we couldn't even really get to the, uh, to the foreground and that's because the, the instrument itself has turned out to be a little bit more unpredictable than we expected. 
So whereas we thought we could predict the noise, the instrumental noise, um, it turned out to be up to 10 times larger, but sometimes just, just three times larger than we had expected it to be theoretically. But you have to consider that we are dealing with an experiment with LOFAR where um, the signal that we're, we are seeking is 10,000 times smaller than the foregrounds, but it's also 10 times smaller than the instrumental noise itself. So this is a real signal to noise issue in that it's mostly noise with a, with a hint of a garnish of signal, if you will. So it's no longer that it has taken a while. But it's also great that there are places, uh, collaborations within the field that are still pursuing what might consider a little bit more of a simpler approach, um, but by no means less important. And that is to not look at um, imaging, ooh, not look at imaging, <laughs> yeah, goodness me, not look at imaging um, whole sections of the sky, but just taking the temperature, the global brightness temperature, how, how much, of, uh, yeah, the, the brightness of this 21 centimeter radiation averaged across the whole sky. So the, a, this is called a global signal experiment. Um, and these experiments tend to concentrate on the dark ages um, uh, where they take the temperature of the gas. And what they do is they don't try to look for through images for this bubble structure, for example. What they do instead is they just focus on the dark ages and they watch for, they, they tune their telescope and they look through the first 200 million years of bang and they look for when that gas starts to be heated. Because when these first stars form, they're producing lots of radiation and it might not be enough radiation to visibly produce these ionized bubbles at that time, but it is certainly enough to start heating that hydrogen and start showing that. So we have had experiments such as EDGES. Um, there is one called SARAS. Uh, this is EDGES. So this is um, the metal table in the desert. <laughs> this is in um, the Murchison. Uh, desert uh, in Australia, so it's actually where the SKA is going to be built. Uh, it's run by a team of US uh, researchers. Uh, they did come out with a result, but only yesterday the latest paper has, has come out saying that they unfortunately think that that result was um, a figment of the instrumentation or uh, error from the foreground removal. But as a, as a concept of, a, of an experiment, it's very promising, which is to take this temperature. So, so the, the experiment that's actually just kind of proved it wrong, as it were, is, is fascinating. It's a, an antenna that floats on a lake in India. Um, and that is to try and eliminate um, any of the problems with this, this ground wire plane thing. But, but apparently, I don't know too much about this, but apparently has caused quite a lot of problems within the data for edges. So I thought, let's eliminate it completely and put it on a lake. Let's create a completely different environment. And this is the beauty of working with global experiments because you just need one antenna to take an average of this sky. Um, you don't need 130,000 antennas. So one group of scientists with a very small budget can do this kind of experiment. Um, and get really creative with putting it on a lake. Or I interviewed somebody in Berkeley who has was at the time I interviewed in April had been camping with his son, um, with, with his son and an RFI detector, um, going around Utah trying to find a canyon that was quiet enough to hang an antenna from um, either wall in in order to try and eliminate. Uh, this this uh, the ground problem entirely and I, I interviewed somebody else that was going up to um, the Arctic at, at that time same time actually hacking and he had this massive suitcase of um, geology tools to measure all of the, the properties of the soil and the reflectivity and all of this is the global people are a whole different set <laughs> <laughs> Deferometry people um, but they are very complimentary and I don't need these slides um, it is it is it is interesting to to see and the other thing that's great with global is that it it's a lot easier to consider what is the natural next step of our field which is to go to the moon um because we are always seeking quieter environments um even in the western australian desert it is not quiet 
uh, especially with the satellites. Um, and so going to the moon is very attractive. There have been missions that have gone into lunar orbit um, to measure the RFI environment of the moon. So that was, a, I think, I want to pronounce it, Chung A4 went up um, and that had an antenna uh, on the relay satellite called Kwekwe. And that is a Netherlands China um, collaboration, which is which is measuring the dark ages RFI environment. How well could we do these global experiments from the moon, eliminating a lot of the Earth-based RFI? But sadly, not all of it. I mean, certainly there's been more and more meetings recently which have expressed deep concern at how busy the moon is getting, at how even the dark side of the moon, so-called the far side of the moon, is, is no longer quiet because of all of these relay satellites like Kwekwe that have been put up um, by very, all, all, all countries that are involved in, in space exploration. You need these relay satellites to, 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 to relay this information, but you dirty your, um, your spectral window. You, you are not aiming spectral hygiene, as one person put it to me, um, but still quieter than Earth. And this is one that I just wanted to mention um, to, to, to round off the talk, because it's a beautiful idea. So this has gone through several iterations. But there is the idea of building an array on the far side of the moon. Um, this would block RFI in the most efficient manner. You could you could carry on doing your your observations at all times. Um, and there have been some wonderful thoughts about how to do this. You want it to be robotic because it costs a hell of a lot to get people on the moon. Um, one early iteration of this was to land moon rovers, about 50 moon rovers on the far side, each with an antenna on its back, and then remotely program them to dance into different formations according to what you were hoping to observe, which I, is still my favourite idea. Um, but sadly, perhaps the poetry of it was too much and uh, they went for something <laughs> that was a little bit more grounded, um, which is this uh, at the minute, which is called Farside, and it's where you land this um, main module but upon that is is loaded on this one there's four of these antenna strips um and they 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 just unfurl into whichever direction these two wheeled little mini rovers unfurl into to, to create the different patterns that you might want your array to um form now i know very little about this because there's not much public information on it it's not funded um, but I can tell you that having worked in this field for, for however long, um, lunar missions have always been mentioned, but certainly in the last three, four years, they've really become a reality. Um, in the, it, this, is, this is the next thing that's going to be going on now. And it's not going to be until the 2030, probably. But um, I, do, I do believe that lunar, lunar science for this area is, is, is definitely the next way. And then... Um, yeah, well, oh, it looks like that should be a video, but it's not. Uh, it's not actually a video, but it's only looking at the low resolution that I'm like, they should have made a video of it on the furling, but I guess that costs too much when you haven't been funded yet. Um, beautiful idea, anyway. I could look at that for ages. Uh, yeah. So, oh gosh, I've got anything to say. Yeah, it's been it's been a it's been a very interesting six to nine months in this field. JWST has really set the scene um, in terms of being able to find those earliest galaxies almost daily now. Um, it's certainly given us a lot more mystery um, in terms of these galaxies are a little bit bigger than we expected. Um, there's there's various things like that, that that certainly warrant further exploration. So even if you were saying, you know, what JWST has got it down, it's got its next 10 years or whatever it's going to be doing a great job we don't need radio if you want to go into this dark ages into this era of the first stars you have to have radio jwst is not going to do it so that's about me finished i am going to end there um have written a book do feel free to buy it or buy it for your friends or buy it for whoever you want i, I wrote it for my mum because uh, you didn't know what I did, um, but you are all free to read it. So thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, we've got some time for, um, for questions. So um, just unmute and ask away. <clears throat> I can see one in the chat while yes, people. Okay. If you can see that, that's fine. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, if if while 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 people um have a have a think. Uh, yeah. So Mike's asked pulsar studies extract data with um, signal to noise ratios it's more than one. Um, yes, we work at we work at signal to noise ratios. If you're considering the foregrounds of oh, you're testing me now. 0 0.0001. <laughs> like that's like one, one to ten thousand um but then with the signal to noise of low far if you're talking actual instrumental noise we are currently we're talking about 0 0.001 signal to noise um it, it seems impossible when you say it out loud and <laughs> um and quite frankly with this kind of experiment with the kind of statistics that we're having to use we're using artificial intelligence as well increasingly um even somebody like me from LOFAR, I would not completely believe a result from LOFAR until it had been validated and verified by one of the other telescopes. Um, that's not because I don't believe in it. I think it's a feature of the very difficult experiment that we're trying to do. Um, and it's it's like gravitational wave astronomy. You needed you needed the two to, to, to be able to understand it. So, yes, we do work at them just about. <laughs> But, oh, I should say with the square kilometer array, um, our signal to noise is going to be about one. Uh, so we're, the, the telescope is that much more sensitive that we're bringing our noise levels down to, to hopefully on order of the signal, which will be a dream <laughs> to work with. Um, the square kilometer array is extremely sensitive. I tell this to anybody who will listen, but it's going to be able to detect an airport radar on a planet 10 light years away, which is just phenomenal and in the very marginal way i'm involved in seti it's um yeah it's it's an incredible achievement for any telescope to be able to do that when does that come online fully 2028 will be um first light for in terms of science results um we will expect to begin getting the kind of first very dirty data in around 2025 um, it will take years of calibration, as did LOFAR. However, we're very lucky in the first stars field in that um, my collaboration will get the first access during what we call commissioning. So all of that dirty data. So we will get access to the data years before kind of the science ready data. Um, and that's because we are kind of the, one of the only collaborations which needs to have access to the data from the point of it being raw data from the antenna right through to where it is given on a hard disk to a PhD student to just do some statistical magic on once it's all been converted into Kelvin or whatever. Um, because it is such a, such a tricky project, we need control of all levels. And so we're one of the only collaborations that actually knows how to do, what, do all of this stuff. And so it's the only people that can really calibrate it by looking at stuff in our field and using our methods so we're very lucky we might get some very early very very early science in the mid 2020s but yeah it's going to be the end of the 2020s but we have we're not like jwst in the we're waiting for a launch date and if that launch date is pushed everything is pushed the beauty of the ska is it has been greenlit for construction antennas are already on the ground in the prototype and it is just a case of building out now that's the beauty of radio right station by station so it's on its way. Interesting question from Tony here. Is there anything in your observations that could persuade you that the Big Bang isn't a real concept? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> didn't see that one coming, did you? I didn't. <laughs> no, I didn't. Um, I really struggled to answer that question, actually. Um, Assuming the Big Bang happened is such an integral part of my field because you have to have a beginning to have a first star. <laughs> um, so different possibilities such as like steady state theorem 
uh, where you, d you don't have this big bang, it, it just wouldn't make sense to search for a first star. So I, I struggle because you do see such an evolution in, in metallicity over the universe. You see, yeah, so, so I, I, I really, really struggle to, to say that <clears throat> I can find anything, but maybe my mind is just not open. Um, would JWST be able to confirm or, or, or dispute the Vicep 2 findings? Is anybody working on this? I, I actually don't know the question, the answer to that one. Um, yeah, I, I, have I have absolutely no idea about that one, I'm afraid, uh, according to that, that um, synergy. No, sorry. Oh, goodness, we've got some very, um, you, this is why I was quite terrified about giving this talk, because I'm like, I'm going to get some very specific <laughs> questions, but I am going to be like, I don't know, I just do for ground removal. Um, in terms of, there's a big gap between JWST, um, mid-infrared, and the ALMA sub-millimeter. Again, I couldn't actually tell you why the band is not being explored. Quite often, um, when we decide what bands are being explored, it is um, fashion. So certainly for the square kilometre array, um, the original scope of the telescope was, was to cover large frequency bands. And as our um, champagne tastes were, were brought into reality a little bit, uh, we did have to start losing frequency bands. And there was quite a, a fierce competition, for example, for from pulsars to the people that wanted to do surveys, for the people that wanted to do the first stars. Um, to the point where at one point at a conference um, we went to Italy and we, we went on this trip and there were the three coaches that had to carry everybody on this trip to, to uh, volcanoes and the volcanoes and um, instead of having like coach one, coach two, coach three they had um, they had coach low band, mid band, high band um, and basically just said that you know we coach had the most people on got to keep the keep the frequency bands <laughs> for the square kilometre away um, so I do I do worry a little bit that sometimes it is that <laughs> that boring and, at the, and luckily for the first star science it's going to be very fashionable after JWST to do it um so we are not in danger but it it is quite possible that that, that these big gaps are not for any reason apart from that people just weren't lobbying hard enough for it when the budget cuts came in would you like to speculate on why early galaxies are bigger than expected <laughs> Yeah, so this this could be because star formation started a lot earlier. Um, in fact, it, it almost certainly is because star formation started a lot earlier. Why did star formation start a lot earlier? To do that, you have to have a universe which is cooler than you expect. Um, <laughs> why? Quite possibly we've got the chemistry wrong um, in terms of how these pristine or, or you know what we call clean clouds just made of hydrogen and helium how they can cool down they aren't able to cool down as efficiently as clouds with lots of metals in because they don't have the same um, cooling mechanisms from the atomic transitions so they can't cool down that's why you get more massive stars it might be that we don't understand that process because it we can't find it in the universe around because there is no pristine gas left quite possible we don't understand that um there are people which which try to kind of, kind of thinking about the edges results one of the, the the things that edges came up with when they did this global temperature measurement was that the universe was a lot colder than they expected um and they suggested at the time that that could be due to dark matter interacting with the hydrogen gas which isn't um normal <laughs> because because dark matter is not meant to interact with stuff um it's not meant to pull things down uh it's meant to just act gravitationally so if that were a factor then you would expect quite a different universe um that is a very exotic model i hasten to add but i include it in there because it is a mystery of quite large proportion which could get quite exciting i really already is exciting but yeah some something is creating stars earlier than they should be Uh, let's have a quick look. Um, any future pro projects that you are working towards? Um, it's the lunar missions. 
So um, the lunar missions are going to be a good 10 years lead time. Um, so for me, I'm beginning to get a little bit involved in, in looking at, um, I'm more interested in the ones that orbit the moon because I think they're going to be a lot cheaper. Um, but, but certainly looking at that and from a sociology point of view, I'm fascinated with the idea of how we protect the spectra on the moon. Uh, because whereas we can have federal laws and all sorts down here protecting the spectrum um, and making sure that we have protected bands for our radio science, uh, as much as satellites going overhead might ignore that, um, on the moon, there's nothing. Uh, so following the policy of that really fascinates me, even though it's not technically the science part of it. That That is something that I like to think about a little bit more. A minute, a bit proactive on it. Your field is moving very quickly. Um, what kind of time frame do you think before we should get you back again to update us? <laughs> Sorry, I had somebody give uh, they, they they signed onto a talk I gave a few nights ago and they said, in your book, you said that there would be a result two years in the future, and you wrote your book in 2020. Oh my god. <laughs> You're probably online now. I'm sorry if you are. But oh my god. <laughs> um yeah, if I said two years, <laughs> like, like it is it has not been as good as two years as um I mean I wrote that before the pandemic, right? Uh everything shut down. We are now at the point, like I said, where we are finally at the point where we're just churning the data through what is what we call a golden pipeline of calibration. I'm hoping within the next couple of years if not a year we'll have the first kind of detection um, of, of this this first stars era so don't hold me to it we shall we shall watch the press with bated breath uh, Emma but I'm I will gonna... always be so happy to come and talk to this group because honestly I think it's the I, I I'm just talking to you about uh, talk to people on the Supermassive podcast. I don't know if anybody listens to that from the Royal Astronomical Society. But I uh, visited a friend that runs that, Izzy Clark, and I was telling her all about your group. And I was like, you should have seen what they were doing during like the volcano thing. And they're like trying to see it in the data. And I'm like, they make these home kits. And so she took a picture of the home kit and she was like, I have to talk about this on the Supermassive podcast. So um, yeah, I, I, anytime, anytime. I've always got time for you. Uh, so you're, you're very kind. Yeah, I was very pleased to see your VLF uh, receiver sitting behind you there. Yes, it's normally in my office at work, um, but I brought it here because I didn't need to, to think I'd just switched allegiances with the Celestron. So I was like, oh, I, I, I better kind of, you know, bring it back. It's normally in my office at work. <laughs> uh, Paul, could I just chip in with a question? I, course, is, yeah. is Rodney Buckland still on the, on the presentation? Um, you commented that the radio surveys of the Murchison were done way back in the 60s, you know, around the time they you know, were surveying for the best place for the next generation of optical scopes. Was that actually part of a thought of building a significant observatory facility out in the Murchison Desert? No, I don't think so. Um, ah. uh, I, it was a, a university vacation job. Um, for me, um, given by Carnarvon Tracking Station. And they say, go south, young man, with a radio receiver and travel around Murchison for the next two months with a tent and find out what the radio noise level is. So I did. Goodness. <laughs> well, that's a, that's, that's a job. I had no idea what it was for. And it was very, uh, it was very adventurous of me to go out in the middle of nowhere week after week, uh, with occasional visits to Geraldton and Carnarvon to restock my yeah, yeah. green tins and things. Mm -hmm. But I had no idea what it was for. But somebody in NASA had decided that would be a good job for a student at the University of Western Australia. So there we are. Ah, really, That's thank you. Really interesting. Oh, thank you for highlighting. A little, that, a little bit of history to add to your history. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I know. I've, I've literally just written that down. If you don't mind, <laughs> that's really interesting. I just love that it's exactly the same as what um, my colleague Aaron Parsons was doing with his son, just going around with an RFI detector with a tent 
and going to his old his old camping spots that he he was brought up with and, and seeing if he can find the quietest one so it is always that case and now we're going to the moon to do the same thing so yeah, quite a different territory emma can i ask a question please tony here um do you ever meet my mate or ex-colleague tim stevenson who uh He's the chief engineer on the SKA. I I know the name. I can't put a face to it. Did, did he work at Jodrell Bank? Yes, but he used to work okay. at Leicester University with me. But the, there's a nice connection because on the Webb uh, telescope, he helped design the carbon fibre struts that hold the Miri camera. Uh, right. Oh, OK. So uh, there's a connection back to both parts of your uh, talk there. So. <laughs> Oh, so you used to work with him, did you say? That's right. Yes, he helped uh, help help me design things like Swift and uh, such right. like. Oh, nice! Oh, amazing. Okay, no, I will have to keep an eye. I know the name. It's going to bother me now, but I'm, I'm yeah, sure. He's, he's your. He's the, well, at least he was a year or two ago. And I assume he's still there. He was the chief engineer, and he he went out there and had to fix um, dishes that sort of drooped or things like that you know um so many complications when you've got thousands of dishes and all these antennas lots of absolutely. things absolutely and, and and there's been discussions about how how you can tell this about whether you should which antenna of the hundred thirty thousand is is broken and like having lights on them everywhere. but i have to it's just sparked in my mind something that's interesting about the sk that's interesting for this group i think is that um there was a decision to really separate out the science from the engineering um which i i'm not i'm not 100 percent behind um in that we have conferences for some we have science conferences and engineering conferences so scientists very rarely come across the engineers uh, and vice versa and this can lead to a little of, of discomfort in in suggesting saying you know the scientists will be like but we need this to happen for my science and the engineer is going yes but you clearly don't understand how it actually works and we can't do this um and and there being like the the office at jodrell bank being the middleman <laughs> um discussing between these two camps is it a necessity with something this large that no one person can understand the whole thing yes but it, this i i do think there's there can be a bit of division so it's it's not surprising to me that i work closely with the sk but have not come across necessarily your your friend that's an engineer unfortunately much as i try and keep an interest in both camps but i do think it's important to know your antenna as much as your end product data sticking my retired engineer hat on from the up from the other side of the fence it's always nice to know why you're building something and what what it's for and why it's the way it is so the disconnect would, would cut both ways mm. are there any more questions anybody okay i'm going to close off the call now um Thanks again, Emma. We do um, really appreciate you giving up your time for us this evening and in putting that together for us. A really interesting, a really interesting presentation. And we and we will have you back to uh, up, up, update us in the future. Sure. Thank you all. Thanks very much. And we'll have a great Christmas. Yes, when, when does the book come out? Oh, well, the second one, the radio astronomy mm. one. Uh, it was due uh the first draft was due last july and i haven't done it yet so oh, right. <laughs> you know the problem was that i got i got really interested in seti i was writing this chapter and i was thinking it would just take two weeks it will be fine got so hooked on the the technology behind seti that i ended up flying out to california to interview jill tarter going to arecibo doing six months of SETI writing and then forgetting that I had the rest of the book <laughs> to write. So it's way past his deadline. I'm hoping it will be out in about a year's time. We wait with bated breath. <laughs> Good night, one and all. <laughs>